This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the place that God calls us together. Let us rejoice and glad in it. These are the people God has called into discipleship. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is God's world and we are called to love it. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Ever seen one of these before? Yeah. Yeah, what is it? A globe. What does it represent? The whole world. Do you know where we are on it? Can you find it? You can find it? Show me where it is. Well, there's a lot of ocean. That's another place. That's not us. There's a huge continent. Where'd we go? I think you're right. Yeah, right around there, kind of. On this scale, we're just below Mount Whitney, so that's how close we are. Yes, that's where we are now. Let's try. Let's see. Have you ever been to Shanghai? No? Let's try something else. Uh, uh, uh. Come on, I need it. Let's try there. Have you ever been to Istanbul? No? All right, let's try something a little bit closer. Have you ever been to uh, Chicago? No? 
It's worth going. They make, a, they make this cheesy, it's, a, it's, it's called the Chicago Mix. Okay? It's caramel corn and cheese corn mixed together, and it is the best thing in the world. It's worth going all the way to Chicago for, believe me. Now, if you wanted to go to Chicago, how would you do that? Would you just jump in the car and go? Oh, right, you don't have driver's licenses yet. So you'd need somebody to help you get there, right? And you'd have to figure out how to get all the way from, see, all the, all the way from there, right? Yeah, all the way over here. You have to get across the mountains and the really boring part in the middle, you know, Iowa and <laughs> Kansas, places like that, to get all the way to Chicago. What would be the best way to go somewhere that you have never been before? Well, maybe, maybe an airplane. What if it's, what if it's at the end of a river? I didn't think about that. What would be a good way to get there? Car could be a good way to get there. What would be a good way to get there? A boat might be a boat. No, I'm thinking more along the lines, if I was going to go to some place I had never been before, the first thing I'd do is I'd find somebody who's already been there, right? Then they could tell me, hey, you want to go here? This is the way to go. This is the best place to come in, and this is the best place to stay, and this is the best place to eat. Here's all the fun things about the town. Here's places you don't really want to go. All of that because somebody who's already been there can show us the way to get there. The lesson today that we're going to read with the adults is where Jesus says to the disciples, I am the way. He said that because he told the disciples, I'm going to go and get a place ready for you, and you, you guys already know the way to get there. And, and Thomas, remember Thomas was the guy who, he, uh, he was, sometimes he was a little doubtful. He always wanted a little more proof. And he says, Jesus, we don't know where you're going, and so we don't know the way. And Jesus says, I am the way. When you know me, you know the way to go. Wherever, wherever you go. Wherever you go, Jesus has a way for us to go. A way of love for one another. And if you go that way, then you can meet anybody and make friends with them, and they can tell you, boy, you go down this street, and they're going to have that caramel corn cheese corn already hot and crispy for you. The way that we follow is in the way of Christ who goes before us and shows us how to go wherever we want to go in the world and for the world. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we give you thanks that you go before us and have given us the person of Christ to show us your way of love, grace, and compassion. In his name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is Aaron, and this is my friend Ethan. We think Jesus is one of the neatest guys to ever walk this planet. That's why we've created these really neat crosses. Yeah, we want everyone to know just how neat Jesus is. And anyone who wants to follow Jesus can take up their cross, forget about their self, and follow. Hey, here's Gary Van Shallow. He walks the pulp culture Jesus path. This path appeals to the trendy Christian in all of us. If the church is the neatest place to be, then you'll want to take up this cross. Show us your cross, Gary. It's got Coach Jesus helping kids win at their favorite sports. Neat, right? He cares more about winning than being holy. And there's Hipster Jesus, unassuming, non-aggressive, technologically savvy, yet environmentally conscious. He even has blue eyes. This cross lets all your BFFs know you're really with it. With this cross, you'll be a winner and won't have to worry about the needs of others around you. How neat is that? See you later, Gary. Oh, here's Wendy Y. Risk, who always takes the easy path. If you're looking for a comfortable faith, something with no challenges, no disappointments, then you'll want to take up the comfy cross. Pretty and fluffy, this cross comforts and protects you from all the troubles of the world, especially those tensions that are part of being a Christian in a fallen world. Neat, huh? Follow the path of least resistance, and you will live out your faith in a continually pleasant and protective bubble. Bye, Wendy. Have a really neat day. Our friends scarcely and hardly be seen only strike out twice a year. Even though it's not a holiday, they've dropped in for a visit. Hey, scarcely and hardly, show the folks your really neat crosses. 
I bet you can guess what times of years they pick up their crosses. We won't keep you any longer. Thanks for dropping by. Hey, busy Miss Lizzie, slow down for a second. Let us see your cross. This, the busy cross has sticky notes, push pins, and a chalkboard, chalk included. How neat is that? You can load up every minute of your life and this cross can handle it. This is the cross for the Christian who has every minute of her or his week planned with, and little time for taking a faith hike, even on the weekend. When Lizzie has a minute to herself, she says a prayer for strength and checks off another thing on her list. And Timmy C. Treble has the newest version of this cross. It's the pocket-sized crisis cross. It's really popular with students at exam time, among motorists and fender, men fender benders, whitewater canoeists who lose their paddles in Class 5 rapids, and lost children in malls. The neat thing about this cross is it can be hidden until a crisis arrives, until you need some divine intervention. Until then, while your path is smooth and easy, the mini crisis cross can rest safely in your pocket. No one will even suspect you have one. That's really neat. Hey, Aaron, show us your cross. This cross has really rocked some votes over the years. Yeah, it's the all-accepting all cross. Its message is simple. We believe that Jesus' invitation to come follow me is offered to all. Everyone and anyone who wants to follow on the path of grace, compassion, and justice is welcome, regardless of gender identity, sexual orientation, faith tradition, race, ethnicity, physical limitations, or economic status. All means all. How neat is that? That's pretty neat. Not sure what all the fuss is about. Now, it's my turn. <laughs> this is the original cross. It may not look too hot, and we don't see many people taking this one up because it requires a lot. This cross is for anyone who wants to deny themselves, sacrifice their wants and need to serve others, love their enemies, speak and live the truth, walk the extra mile for others, and trust God. It's not as flashy as the other crosses. It's simple and carries a clear statement. Yeah, and don't forget the lifetime guarantee. Only with this cross. How do you use that? I'll take part in singing at 2148. Let's sing together. dinner on Friday evening, she said very directly, I think you should say something about 9-11 on Sunday. I know I still feel wounded. This is not a distant empathy. Fifteen years ago today, Karen was in Washington, D.C. with a flight booked into New York the next day, and I had a flight booked the next day from Denver to join her there. She ended up trapped in Washington for uh, a week or more before she could make her way to her sister's in New Hampshire and waited it out until she could get a flight back home. I was glad to know my wife's feelings so clearly, although it was also troubling what she was asking of me. So I shared my thoughts and concerns with her as I do now with you, because I recognize what is true for one is likely to be true for others. There are a few layers to my pastoral caution about prayer, particularly prayer about something as potent as 9-11. The first is that anything of deep moral and emotional impact, especially at the national 
and in this instance global level, is always appropriated and typically manipulated by different interests from many angles and for many purposes, some of them worthy, some of them questionable, and some decidedly not. Therefore, to touch on something like 9-11 is to enter into that morass of conflicting interests and sometimes abuse. To claim it within the context of sacred worship and to attempt to shape meaning through prayer is ripe for misappropriation, misunderstanding, and even a kind of consensual idolatry. So it is something I needed to think about and to pray about before jumping in, and I invite you to do the same. I am also especially sensitive to the fact that 9-11 is overwhelmingly framed by strong feelings of American patriotism. And I am sensitive to the fact that this anniversary happens to intersect with a multitude of current incidents and issues in this year, not the least of which is the presidential campaign, that have cranked up the question, what does it mean to be an American, to a level that includes vitriol and even violence. So while our memories are strong, they do not exist in isolation, but inevitably call up our current issues and their meanings, feelings, and concerns. At another practical level, ministry over the years has taught me that what is important and meaningful to one person, even to several persons, maybe even to many, does not mean that everyone shares that same sense of importance and meaning. It may even have a very different, even sharply contrasting level of importance or meaning. Given that we come together here in worship, a setting in which we are implicitly all equal before God, and therefore have equal standing before one another, how does what we do together here allow for, and more importantly, respect that variety, that diversity of meanings in the context of equal standing? As a pastor, I cannot assume equal meaning among all, and we cannot assume it as a people who are called to love one another, to care for what one another is feeling, what is meaningful to each of us, and that it may be different from one to another. So what would be the touchstone by which to find a way forward? It is the moral ethic of the Christian gospel to pay primary attention and give moral weight, even divine weight, to whomever is most vulnerable, especially vulnerable to the majority, either by social and informal means or by the formal and institutionalized means of power, that is, our laws and how we carry them out. So in our dinner conversation, my ears perked up when Karen shared a news report of interviews of people who were in New York on 9-11 and, and survived to share their experience, especially how it changed their lives afterwards. One of those was a young woman who talked about how radically different her life was after 9-11 because she was a New York resident and American citizen of Middle Eastern descent who grew up in a Muslim household in New York and continued in that faith. What she reported was that the biggest impact was not the chaos and the destruction and death of 9, on 9-11, but rather the radical shift in how she was perceived and treated in the aftermath, even to today. She learned to experience fear, not of terrorists in the sky, but of the prejudice of her fellow city residents on the streets. All of which calls us back to the original truth. 
that what happened in New York on 9-11 and elsewhere was not an American tragedy, but a human tragedy. A tragedy that goes all the way back to when Cain slew his brother Abel. We human beings are incomplete at best, and more often than not broken, wounded, and so often we work out that pain on those around us, some, sometimes in small and personal ways, and sometimes in earth-shaking, coordinated, nation-against-nation, cataclysmic ways. So as we come together to pray, I invite us to seize upon the fundamental purpose of prayer, which has only one valid agenda place ourselves in the presence of the Holy Spirit, to become open, to be spiritually raw and ultimately vulnerable before God, and to when we speak, to speak only for ourselves, to say, perhaps, I am hurt, I am wounded, I want I'm frustrated, broken, angry, hopeful. I am wishful. I am ready for something else. I'm ready to let go, ready to take this broken up mess that is my life and say, what would you have me do, Lord? It's all yours. It was always yours from the beginning, and it will be in the end. So right now, this is where I am. Now, where do you want me to be? And could you give me a hint of how to go there? And what our faith tells us, what our tradition tells us, what our experience tells us is the answer will be silence. Because in the end, that is where true prayer begins, not with our words, and not with our wants, but with silence, so that the eternal mystery might have a few words with us. May God have mercy upon each of us as we offer ourselves in prayer. I invite you as we tried and uh, experienced with during Lent, would you please stand and let us be together in a time of silent prayer. Let us stand. O thou eternal mystery, receive our spirits now. Almighty and gracious God, together we offer this prayer, the one Jesus told us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. While Jesus was living in the Galilean hills, John, called the baptizer, was preaching nearby in the desert country of Judea. 
He lived and dressed like a wilderness monk. He wore a rough, plain robe made of camel's hair, tied at the waist by a simple leather strap. He lived on a diet of locusts and wild field honey. People poured out of Jerusalem, Judea, and the Jordanian countryside to hear and see him in action. There at the Jordan River, those who came to confess their sins, John baptized them into a changed life. His message was simple and austere, like the surrounding desert. Change your life, God's kingdom is here. This message was rooted in Isaiah's prophecy, which John preached in a loud, commanding voice. Here's the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. For the witness of this ancient story, we give thanks to God. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard Flight 291 with service to Mission Oaks Park and the future of the church in 2017 and beyond. We'd like to thank you for flying CUMC Airlines. We know you have a choice of airlines to fly, and we're glad you've chosen to fly with us. Just a little one, there you go. This is the final boarding call for all passengers. The captain will order for the doors of the aircraft to close in approximately five minutes. We are currently second in line for takeoff, so we ask that you please fasten your seatbelts at this time and secure all baggage underneath your seat. We also ask that you put your seats and tray table trays in the upright and locked <laughs> position for takeoff. Please turn off all personal electronic devices, including laptops and cell phones. Smoking is prohibited for the duration of the choir's singing. <laughs> At this time, we ask you to take out your purse or wallet and prepare to make your investment in the success of this flight. We not only want to be able to take off smoothly and achieve flying altitude, but to also fly all the way to where God is calling us and to land safely with air in the tires and all the brakes in good working order. 
Now, as the ushers come forward, please direct your attention to the flight crew who will lead us in a high-flying sing song. Thanks Thank again for, for flying, flying CMC Air. <laughs> These are Jesus' words of advice, promise, and invitation to the disciples who are beginning to understand that there might be more to following this radical rabbi than they first thought. Listen, do not let your hearts be troubled. Just as you believe in God, believe also in me. In the home of our Lord, there are many rooms. If this were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And even though I go, I will come again and accompany you, so that where I am, there you may be also. Truly, you already know that the way to the place where I am going. But Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where we are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. The truth is the only way to life. As you come to know me, you come to know my Father also. When you see me, you are seeing him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Amen. Once upon a time, I went for a bike ride. That's not actually me. I couldn't find the one I was looking for, but that will have to suffice, suffice for now. Went for a bike ride, actually a lot of bike rides. 43 years ago, I rode my first century, 100 miles. And 42 years ago, I did my first uh, tour, went over 1,000 miles to the fabulous city of Oz, otherwise known as Minneapolis. <laughs> we started the whole thing. It was, it was my coming-of-age journey, and I remember my... Uh, compatriot in, in troublemaking, Lee, as we were loaded up in the driveway and got ready to go. After all the work we had put in, we'd been working two jobs to get the money, etc., and we were going to be starting college in the fall, he said very simply, let's go for a bike ride. Every ride ever since. I've always started with that phrase on my lips or in my mind. Since then, I've done uh, 24 uh, personal tours on an average of three weeks each and at least uh, 800 miles or more. Fourteen of those were international, most of them with my lovely, willing bride, Karen. Keep in mind, before I bought her a ring, I bought her a bike. 
I didn't remember that, but she reminded me later. And it all started, you know, it all started with that first, really the first bike ride, the first ride without the training wheels, the first time where you find that that strange sense of balance that until you have it, it seems pretty terrifying, and then once you have it, you have it for the rest of your life. Let me just check, is there anybody here who doesn't know how to ride a bike? Because I'd love to teach you how. <laughs> if you don't, see me. Otherwise, you all know what I'm talking about. Once you have that sense, you have it. Now, it's interesting. The other day, I was, uh, you know, you get that, that extraordinary sense of almost everything you read about cycling, when you read, when you read about bicycling and learning to ride, it's about that. It feels like flying, even if you're on the ground. It feels like you're flying. That incredible sense that starts once you gain that sense. I was cleaning out closet the other day and found something very interesting. I remember that first ride. And what I remember is I was at the, the end of our driveway on the sidewalk. We were at the edge of the township. It was cornfields behind us. And the street running out ahead of me, the sidewalk running out ahead of me, led to those cornfields, led to openness, opportunity, etc. And to get going, I had to steady myself on the foam pole that happened to be at the end of our driveway. And I can remember the feel of that foam pole because it was rough, you know. Cleaning the, cleaning the closet the other day, I found this. It's the first time I started taking pictures with a camera my uncle, who was a photographer, had given me. And the, one of the first pictures I took was this kind of artsy fartsy picture straight up the foam pole and I thought it was interesting because it was kind of bent to one side I didn't put it together in my mind that that was also the point of stability that I let go of to start flying once upon a time I went for a bike ride and that first one morphed into more and more of them I've got so many pictures of riding. I was going to show you some, but no, I figured I'd start with that one. I wish I had a picture of what probably kind of looked like this. There was a time not long after I learned to ride, well, maybe a little longer after I started to ride. I've mentioned here that for a long time it was pretty dark in our house. After my brother was killed in a car accident, it was, there was just a shadow there. And so the bike was a way for me to get out from underneath the shadow. And I remember very clearly the day I rode out and over the freeway overpass into the real rural part of Michigan and somewhere along the way I remember stopping because I was having an out-of-body experience and all of the trees and the fields were glowing and I could see the glow the holiness of creation was so beautiful. And of course, it marked me for the rest of my life. So much so that I had to share that experience of what it feels like to ride and have that kind of encounter. So over the last 30 years, I've designed and organized and led over 28 different tours in the western United States. A more, almost 15,000 miles worth of group tours for other people to participate in, mostly in the national parks here in the West, but also in Europe. And I was able to do that because I learned the way of the randonneur. Randonneur is the French word for a cyclist who rides long distances. It's not the same as a race, but you have to get from point A to point B and do it on your own, and you usually have to do it within a given time. That's the way all of my, our trips have been. You know, if you book a plane ticket, you've got to be able to ride and get back to the plane at the end. There are rules to that way that we go, and chief among them is we do the pedaling. We do all the pedaling. We're independently self-contained. There's no SAG vehicle waiting to pick us up if things go wrong or the weather gets bad, and there's no chilled bottles of beverages waiting at the rest stop. We're out there on our own, and by engaging and encountering that, we learn the skills that give us the competency and the confidence 
so we can go anywhere in the world. That's the way we have learned and the way that I've taught it to others so they can go anywhere in the world. And this summer, sure enough, the 30th edition of that original tour that I started is still going. This year they're doing it uh, up around Seattle. When you learn that way to pedal, you can go anywhere. And so the news, the news for us is uh, we're back on the road again. We're not, uh, we've saved our time this year so that uh, we can go away next year. Just before we have that kickoff day, we're going to go on our next trip. <laughs> Down back into south, south, south Chile. We, uh, just September 1st, finally booked the tickets. For, it's for real. Now we're on the hook. We'll leave out of Los Angeles and go all the way down near the tip of South America. And then we'll start riding from there. We were there a year ago and did a loop out of Puerto Montt. And on this one, we're going south towards the Antarctic. If we had another two weeks, we could go all the way. But got to come home. Got to take care of the dog. <laughs> got to take care of business. We're going for another bike ride. I appreciate the opportunity to do so. We'll see. Uh, we'll do it because we'll have an awesome experience, I know. We had an awesome experience down in the southern part of Chile last time. Expect more. Every time we go anywhere, I know something wonderful is going to happen because that's the way it goes when you know the way to go. Once upon a time, I went to a church camp. I had a life-changing campfire experience, as I've shared before, a point at which I recognized both myself and everyone is glowing with God light. I learned the way that Jesus speaks of, the way of truth, which is the way of love, the only way to go in the world. And it was so powerful I had to share it, and so it became my career. It became my way in the world, professionally and personally. And in that sharing and showing you can go anywhere in the world, I've made so many incredible friends, so many friends along the way. Once upon a time, I was appointed to this church. I found you all. Others who know the way or on the way, who have completed many tours and many journeys and men, been many places, completed many trips. I found this church itself just a few years younger, older than myself. So in as much as I am a cyclist, as much as I'm a Christian, and as much a Christian as I am a cyclist, the two are very intertwined for me, literally so. With retirement finally coming into view, I finally will reach back and hopefully claim a dream that I left behind in 1976. That was the bicentennial, and it was the first time there was an organized bike ride across the country. I was in college, and boy, did I want to go. I really wanted to go, but I couldn't. I needed to work that summer. I worked three jobs to stay in school, but I helped a friend go. And later he came back and uh, taught me a few tricks, and we went for a ride here in California. So from then until now, my dream has always been when I retire, that's when I'll ride across the country. Now at uh, 63, years of age, uh, 63 years of age, this body, I'm 60, this body's aging. This body as well is experiencing the ongoing retirement of many of the original members of this congregation. That's just natural. Somewhere down the road in a few years, I expect myself to retire. But we're not there yet. Can we just be clear about that? I'm not there yet. We are not there yet. We still have some miles to go, and perhaps it is the biggest journey yet. Our next tour, our next ride together is to move from that generation which founded and grew the congregation as most of us have experienced, most of you have known it and given to it, into the next generation that will take it beyond those who 
laid the wood on these ceilings and helped to pour this concrete. That trip, that journey, that starting line, I propose, is February 26th. From here to there, we will be in training for that Mardi Gras Sunday on the 26th when we'll shift to the one plus Sunday morning format. That's what the second survey is about, is narrowing down how we want to organize our Sunday mornings. We'll move from one worship and an, another worship service to one worship service plus something we don't have a name for quite yet. We still have, we're still playing with that. We still have to hear from you what shall we call that second part of the morning. Why are we doing that? Even though it's been 42 years since my first century, I need to continue to train to do what I want to do and need to do. The science of cycling, the equipment, and especially the physiology continues to evolve. There's plenty to learn. I have four different magazines and several websites that I track just to learn, continue learning how to do what I want to do. And at the same time, my own body is changing and the, the environment in which I ride is changing. So there's always learning for me to do for me to be on these journeys. And in the same way, Receiving and claiming the gift of faith and affirming it with membership here in this church does not mean that you are done being formed by Christ. The way of Christ is a lifelong study and practice. It requires constant training. Cal will tell you that his real learning started in his 80s. He's over 100 now and still hungry to know. It's the truth of John Wesley's saying about going on to perfection. There is always more for us to learn and know about how to be on the way of Christ. Likewise, just as our bodies grow older, the spiritual challenges we face change as we get older. I know from my conversations with so many of you that as we grow older, Even as all as much as we know all that we've been through, there are still challenges that call us into spiritual study and growth. The bottom line, frankly, is that investing in our own spiritual growth not only nourishes us, research shows that churches whose members are growing spiritually are the ones who grow in membership. One hour of worship alone doesn't do it. We need that training time together, that study time together. That's what the second part of the Sunday morning needs to be devoted to. Another part of it, uh, by way of parallel, after 40 years of cycling, I'm always acutely aware of the need to pass along what I have learned. When I'm out driving, when I'm out riding, I I see so many people riding. It's marvelous, the blossoming of cycling that's yet again happening right now. But I see so many people who are clumsily and painfully trying to ride. And I could, oh, I could help them. But I found it's really rude to pull up along somebody riding and say, hey, you know what you should be doing? No, that doesn't, not really helpful. <laughs> but I know they, could, they, they deserve help. They could use that help. And it's the same for people of faith. If you've been following in the way of Christ for a few decades, it is incumbent upon you to share what you have learned, just as others mentored you along the way. This is why the second half of Sunday mornings will will be devoted to that starting in the end of February, nurturing our own spiritual growth and sharing the learning of your journey with others who are on the same journey together. Now, if that's the starting line, like any tour, it will require many kinds of preparation. Karen and I are already uh, engaged in the physical training for our ride. We did 60 miles yesterday over to Santa Barbara and back, and we're going to be ramping that up till we get to the point around Christmas time where we're knocking off 100 miles every weekend. That's what we need to do to be ready to do what we're going to do when we go down south. So also, we will be in training here. We'll be working with smaller groups of you about hospitality, leadership for some of the groups that we're discussing, working out what those startup groups would be on Sunday morning, where they will be, how to locate more of what we do beyond this campus 
to be where others are. And perhaps most crucially, how to recognize and respect the different needs that different people bring into worship and how different kinds of worship can meet their needs as well as ours. That's a part of our training together. We want to be compassionately flexible and adaptable so that others can truly experience worship in ways that are meaningful to them, so that, so that they see the glow, they feel that glow, even if they are different from ours because we already have that most precious resource, which is this fellowship of faith that will see us through so that others can be a part of this. Between now and February, I'll continue to work with the church council to develop the skills and capacities we need to make this journey together. But let me be clear. Let me be crystal clear. Just like the bike tours, at least that I run, I can design and teach and coach and map and do all that, but we all have to pedal. Are we clear on that? We all have to carry our own stuff. Choose wisely. We are all together on the way. A few quick tangible signs of our working toward this next part of the journey, getting ready for this next part of our journey together into the future. The media team, thank you as always, crew, have been knocking themselves out to design a a nearly complete overhaul of our sound and video system. This will enable us to not only have a better experience just in worship in here, but also to capture and distribute what we do and put it out on the many platforms where people are now checking out what happens here and sharing that with others. You can expect to see some changes, hopefully by Christmas, and you can expect a small fundraising campaign as well with more complete changes taking place after the first of the year. Secondly, right now, today... We have a new website for the church going up. We will be moving our existing content over and creating new content. Why why are we doing this? Why Why is this important? Why am I bothering to tell you? Because the web is now undeniably and inescapably the communications medium of those whom we are called to serve. In other words, everybody who is not here out there that we want to share with. We'll continue to use print for those who currently need it, and where it is sometimes relevant. But we must have an up-to-date website capable of serving as the hub of our digital presence in, literally, the world. I want to say a special word of thanks to Pam for the time and creativity and energy that she's put in to help make this happen. In a familiar mode, uh, a similar more nuts and bolts, literally, mode, we're working on a redesign of this chancel area here, the choir loft area, to make it a more flexible space for not only the chancel and the bell choirs, but all the kinds of music that Luvi has been developing and continue to build on this congregation's reputation as ground zero of some of the best music in the area. Those are just a few of the technical changes we're undertaking for our journey on Christ's way into the future. Can I tell you one more? Uh, For Karen and I to do this next trip, we realized we also would need some new equipment. So we're getting a new tandem. Now, some of you say, what? Another one? Okay, so we already already sold one to finance this one, and I have another one available for sale. If you're interested, please see me afterwards. So we've ordered the new tandem, and... I checked the tracking number this morning. It's due to be delivered tomorrow, so I may be a little distracted tomorrow. Just giving you a heads up. It's exciting to be excited about the future. Yes? Isn't that a good feeling? To have a clear objective, a goal, clarifies so much of what we want to do. As complicated and as difficult as it will be, as hard as some of the work will believe, be, believe me, it's going to be work to get where we want to go helps to have a clear objective. So let me offer at least one version, one possibility of framing a clear goal for our journey into the next generation of CUMC's mission. One more. Once 
upon a time. Actually, that would be uh, six weeks ago. We baptized Olivia Grace Skeens. My goal, which I suggest as our goal, is to follow in the way of Christ so vigorously, so enthusiastically, so thoroughly, that when she, Olivia, Olivia, not Shannon, Olivia, when Olivia is a grandmother, she'll be able to sit down with her grandkids and say, once upon a time, The people who baptized me were so passionate about being the church, the people on the way, that they did everything it took to make it possible for me to go back there as their pastor. And that's how I came to baptize each one of you in the same place where I was lifted up and anointed as a child of God. Are you willing to make this journey on Olivia's behalf and on behalf of all who would come here and experience the glow of God's love and learn to see it in every person? If so, would you please say, let's go for a ride. That's That's all I wanted to hear. Amen. Let's do it twice. As you go in Christ's way, keep your butt in the saddle, your eyes on the road, and your heart with God. Go in his peace. Amen.